Testing. Good morning. We'll get started now. I'm Michael Summerfield. This is the fourth in our series of six Lenten forums. So we're 18 days into Lent if you're counting from Ash Wednesday. Our topic today is going to be forgiveness. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is some stories from the past. These are from at least 30 years ago. And I do assure you, if I'm telling you a story from the past, I always update it to make sure that it still makes sense 30 years later. So this is about a willingness to forgive and how that can turn things around. I'd ask you this, is this Lent a time of rebirth for you? A hint of spring at the end of winter. I didn't even wear an overcoat today. I've been able to remember a man from many years ago who came to see me one day when he was very upset. I remember his words. Father, I'm not a good person. In the course of our conversation, it was clear to me that he was not being fair to himself. Yes, he was in trouble, and he knew that he was a sinner. He asked God for forgiveness. What set this man apart in my mind was his awareness that he needed to make some changes in his life. Not everyone has that awareness. Without it, no meaningful change can occur. We fool ourselves into thinking that other people are the ones who have problems and are sinners. This man earnestly desired to do better. I encouraged him to see his strengths, Clearly, his faith was important, he was prayerful, and he had the courage to come to me and lay his problems on the table without blaming anyone else or making excuses. That's extraordinary. My encounter with this man was a reminder to me of those times when it is important to seek spiritual counseling or see a priest then it is possible to give a, per a person encouragement and hope. God reaches out to embrace and warm our cold hearts with love. God enables us to change into warm-hearted people, people who take the risk of forgiving and seeking reconciliation with those who have hurt us most. Another time, I met a man whose story is very common. He was in danger of becoming hard-hearted. Having raised his family, he was often disappointed with the results. His children had gone their separate ways and now had very little contact with their parents. Though they had been brought up in a family where Christian values and traditions were stressed, the children seemed to have abandoned the practice of their religion. Marriages had failed. Everyone was becoming a stranger to each other. When I met him, my first impression was, this is a hard man. Sometime later, though, I saw him in the hospital and came away with a new understanding of him. We talked for an hour, and as I thought about this old story that I'd written down, you don't usually spend an hour in the hospital talking to people, so I'm not going to recommend that, but it must have worked that day. And it was apparent how much he loved his family. Yes, there had been disappointments, frustrations, and unanswered questions. There had been times when his children behaved like the prodigal son, wasting their family heritage in distant places. But my friend had learned something important about the choices he faced. He could be a father who, in the face of these hurts, made it impossible for the children to come home. Some parents make their children walk a very long road before they can be welcome again. Others are like the father in the story of the prodigal son. The memory of a parent's love invites the child to come home even after making a mess of things. 
To make the journey home a little shorter, the father runs to meet his son, forgiving him. Not all of my friend's family problems were resolved, but his great love and willingness to forgive turned things around in good ways. For the remainder of our forum today, I'm going to talk about a couple of, or maybe three stories that I have of forgiveness. And I have this little passage from the author Parker Palmer in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, and he talks about storytelling. Storytelling has always been at the heart of being human because it serves some of our most basic needs passing along our traditions, confessing failings, healing wounds, engendering hope, strengthening our sense of community. And Palmer also says, the more we know about another's story, the harder it is to hate or harm that person. I don't know if any of you read John Grisham novels. Anybody read The Chamber? Or do you remember that one? He's had so many different ones. Anyway, this is an example of a story that, from a novel that really has a message about forgiveness. Another one I might mention that I'm not going to use today, but I did use two years ago when we had our Lenten retreat, is a book called Saint Maybe by Ann Tyler, so if you've never read that, that's really an excellent book. And in fact, if you're reading the Star Tribune this morning, there's a, a review of Ann Tyler's new book called French Braid. What was the title again? Saint Maybe, an odd name, Saint Maybe. In John Grisham's novel, The Chamber, we see God's forgiveness in action. Unfortunately, a key scene was not included in the screenplay of the movie, but in the book, Sam Cahall, a prisoner on death row awaiting his execution, has a change of heart after years of bigotry and hatred that led him to murder innocent people. He can hardly believe that God can forgive him, nor can we believe it. Sam could not make amends for the lynchings, for the bombings, for shattered lives. He did express regret and seek forgiveness from the people whose loved ones had been harmed in such horrendous ways. Sam says, I would be a free man today had I never heard of the Ku Klux Klan. I'd like to make sure God's not angry with me when I die. So he decides to talk to Rolf Griffin, a death row chaplain he calls the preacher. Rolf asks, and why do you think God might be angry with you? Pretty obvious, isn't it, Sam replies. It seems too easy, you know. I just say a quick prayer and everything's forgiven. Why does that bother you? Because I've done some bad things, preacher. We've all done bad things, Sam. Our God is a God of infinite love. You haven't done what I've done. Will you feel better if you talk about it, the preacher asks? Yeah, I won't ever feel right unless I talk about it. Ralph gently placed a hand on the back of Sam's head. Pray with me, Sam. Sam covered his eyes with both hands and rested his shoulders on his knees. The preacher prays, through Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. All the terrible things that burden your heart are now forgiven. Do you believe this, Sam? Yes, yes. 
God's forgiveness, something we celebrate in our Episcopalian tradition in the rite of reconciliation of a penitent, transforms us in love and empowers us to live the lives to which we have been called. Reconciliation is the healing of divisions in our hearts and our relationships. Reconciliation is the work of a lifetime and a rehearsal of that final surrender at death when all divisions cease. If we listen to our hearts, we have regrets when we sin in big or small ways. Sam was led to a change of heart by the example of his grandson, Adam. He says to him, you know what hurts? I've been thinking a lot about this, really flogging myself the last couple of days. You don't hate anybody. You're tolerant and broad-minded, well-educated, ambitious, going places. Without the baggage I was born with, and I look at you, my grandson, my flesh and blood, and I ask myself, why didn't I become something else? We may be asking ourselves the same question. Sin is excess baggage whenever it weighs us down. Until we seek forgiveness from God and others, we are burdened by guilt and shame. After baptism, all Christians are saved yet still sinful, liberated yet ever in need of conversion. In that process of conversion, something or someone or some event rattles our cage. Sometimes we experience a vague discomfort or a restless stirring in our lives or a word that hits home. Sometimes the process of conversion, of transformation, begins when we have experienced a death, or fallen in love, or begun a new job, or become seriously ill. Sometimes the process begins in far less dramatic ways. We read something that touches our hearts. We admire the goodness of another. We become aware of our sinfulness. We long for something more in our relationships or we can't live with the compromises we've made. However we hear God's invitation or experience God's love, it is mediated by the people and circumstances of our lives and it somehow invites us to a new way of life, to a new or deeper relationship with God. We were invited to reconciliation, reconciliation, to transformation. And I want to welcome the people who are at home this morning or who may listen to this later on. And thanks to Elliot for being our tech team. I do have a question at this point and we'll ask if anyone has any comments or questions yourselves. This is the question. How have the people or circumstances of your life invited you to a new or deeper relationship with God? People or circumstances, new or deeper relationship with God. So Kelly has the mic if anyone has any comments here or anyone at home. I just wanted to uh, express my thanks for you recommending the book Conviction by Borg. And our Bible study now is reading it, um, and it's very good. Um, so I thank you for that. And, and that book, along with others we've done in Bible study, have, have really given me a connection 
um, because you read about his life and how he handled it and how he developed and you recognize your own life in it and your own passages and uh, travels. And um, bottom line, Bible study helps you come closer to God. Thank you, Christina. Anyone else? Okay. The people who were at the retreat a couple of years ago will recognize the story, but after a couple of years, you might not remember it. Anyway, there's a book called Blood Brothers, Blood Brothers from 1984. It's by a man named Elias Shakur. And Shakur was born in 1939 to a Palestinian family and became a priest of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church and he's known for his work as a peacemaker. He's still living. His ministry began in 1965 in the village of Ibelin in Galilee. And so this is a story from his early days in Ibelin. And as I said there, he was really concerned about bringing people together. There, there would have been Muslims and Christians. Of course, he was not far from Israelis as well. So this is a story that occurred during Lent at that time. My year and a half of home visits and the sisters' months of ministrations had made a dent, a small dent in reuniting the believers of Ibeline. Few attended the church regularly and walls of hostile silence remained firm. However, most of them would not think of missing services during the Christmas and Easter seasons coming to be comforted by familiar customs, not out of desire for true spiritual renewal. True to the pattern, attendance increased markedly on the first Sunday of Lent, growing each week as Easter approached. Seems to be true here too, right? On Palm Sunday, every bench was packed. Nearly the entire congregation had come plus a few other villagers whom I had invited. The weather that morning was balmy, with a warm light wind straying through the streets. So I left the doors wide open, hoping that passers-by might be attracted by our singing. When I stood up, raising my hands to signal the start of the service, I was jolted by stark, staring faces. Looks of open hostility greeted me, the Responsibles faction, and I don't know what the Responsible is. I think it's somebody, a local dignitary in that, that community, was clustered on one side of the church, almost challenging me with their icy glares. Indifferently, those whom the Responsible had ostracized sat on the opposite side. I was amazed to see Abu Muhib, the policeman, perched in the very front row with his wife and children. In each of the th other three quadrants of the church, as distant from one another as possible, were his three brothers. The sisters, I could tell, felt the tension too, for their faces were blanched. I rose and began the first hymn, certain that no one would be attracted by our pathetically dismal singing. I thought with sadness of the battle lines that were drawn across the aisles of that sanctuary. And nervously, I hoped that no one would notice the odd lump in the pocket beneath my vestment. What followed was undoubtedly the stiffest service, the most unimpassioned sermon of my life. The congregation endured me indifferently, fulfilling their holiday obligation to warm the benches. But then they did not suspect what was coming. At the close of the liturgy, everyone rose for the benediction. I lifted my hand, my stomach fluttering, and paused. It was now or never. 
Swiftly, I dropped my hand and strode toward the open doors at the back of the church. Every eye followed me with curiosity. I drew shut the huge double doors which workmen had rehung for me. From my pocket, I pulled a thick chain, laced it through the handles, and fastened it firmly with a padlock. Hasn't happened here, has it? Returning to the front, I could almost feel the temperature rising, or was it just me? Turning to face the congregation, I took a deep breath. Sitting in this building does not make you a Christian, I began awkwardly. My voice seemed to echo too loudly in the shocked silence. The sisters' eyes were shut, their lips moving furiously in prayer. You are a people divided. You argue and hate each other, gossip and spread malicious lies. What do the Muslims and the unbelievers think when they see you? Surely that your religion is false. If you can't love your brother that you see, how can you say you love God who is invisible? You have allowed the body of Christ to be disgraced. Now the shock had turned to anger. The responsible trembled and seemed as though he was about to choke. Abu Muhib tapped his foot angrily and turned red around the collar. In his eyes, though, I thought I detected something besides anger. Plunging ahead, my voice, voice rose. For many months, I've tried to unite you. I fail because I'm only a man. But there is someone else who can bring you together in true unity. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives you power to forgive. So now I will be quiet and allow him to give you that power. If you will not forgive, we will stay locked in here. You can kill each other and I'll provide your funerals gratis. Silence hung, tight-lipped, fists clenched. Everyone glared at me as if carved from stone. I waited. With agonizing slowness, the minutes passed. Three minutes, five, ten. I could hear outside a boy coaxing his donkey up the street and the slow clop-clop of its hooves. Still no one flinched. My breathing had become shallow, and I swallowed hard. Surely I finished everything, I chastised myself, undone all these months of hard work with my... Then a sudden movement caught my eye. Someone was standing. Abu Muhib rose and faced the congregation, his head bowed, remorse shining in his eyes. With his first words, I could scarcely believe that this was the same hard-bitten policeman who had treated me so brusquely. I am sorry, he faltered. All my eyes were on him. All eyes were on him. I am the worst one of all. I've hated my own brothers, hated them so much I wanted to kill them. More than any of you, I need forgiveness. And then he turned to me. Can you forgive me too, Abuna? I was amazed. Abuna means our father, a term of affection and respect. I had been called other things since arriving in Ibuli, but nothing so warm. Come here, I replied, motioning him to my side. He came, and we greeted each other with a kiss of peace. Of course I forgive you, I said. Now go and greet your brother. Before he was halfway down the aisle, his three brothers had rushed to him. They held each other in a long embrace, each one asking forgiveness of the others. In an instant, the church was a chaos of embracing and repentance. Cousins who had not spoken to each other in years wept together openly. Women asked forgiveness for malicious gossip. Men confessed to passing damaging lies about each other. People who had ignored the sisters and myself in the streets now begged us to come to their homes. Only the responsible stood quietly apart, accepting only stiffly my embrace. The second church service, a liturgy of love and reconciliation, 
went on for nearly a full hour. In the midst of these joyful reunions, I recalled Father's words when he had told us why we must re receive the Jews from Europe into our home. And loudly I announced, we're not going to wait until next week to celebrate the resurrection. Let's celebrate it now. We were dead to each other. Now we are alive again. I began to sing. This time our voices joined as one, the words binding us together in a song of triumph. Christ is risen from the dead by his death. He has trampled death and given life to those in the tomb. Even then it did not end. The momentum carried us out of the church and into the streets where true Christianity belongs. For the rest of the day and far into the evening, I joined groups of believers as they went from house to house throughout Ibeline. At every door, someone had to ask forgiveness for a certain wrong. Never was forgiveness withheld. Now I knew that inner peace could be passed from man to man and woman to woman. As I watched, I recalled, too, an image that had come to me as a young boy in Haifa. Before my eyes, I was seeing a ruined church rebuilt at last, not with mortar and rock, but with living stones. So that's what every church needs, living stones. Any comments? Anybody remember that from the retreat? Okay, we still have some time, so I'm going to share another story that I also shared at the retreat, which I really like. This was written about 40 years ago by John Shea, who at that time was a Roman Catholic priest in Chicago and noted for his writing. He later left active ministry and went on to continue his writing and be married and have grandchildren. And it's... If you're wondering where this is related to in scripture, look up Luke 5, 1 to 11. Luke 5, 1 to 11. It's called going fishing. On a certain rainy night, St. Peter turned to the Lord Jesus and grinned. We're doing real good. We, said the Lord Jesus, Peter was silent. All right, you're doing real good, he finally said. Me, said the Lord Jesus. Peter was silent a second time. All right, God's doing real good, he reluctantly admitted. The Lord Jesus laughed and hit the table with glee. It was the laugh that got to St. Peter. He pushed his face toward Jesus and blurted out, Look it, I was somebody before you came along. You didn't make me. I know now, everybody says, There goes the Lord Jesus and his sidekick, St. Peter. Jesus cures the sick and Peter helps them up. But it wasn't always that way. People knew me in my own right. They would say, There goes Peter the greatest fisherman in all of Galilee. I was respected and looked up to. I heard that you were a very good fisherman, Peter, said the Lord Jesus. You bet I was, and tomorrow I'm going to prove it. We are going to go fishing, and you will see how the other fishermen respect me and look to my lead. I would love to go fishing, Peter. I've never been fishing, said the Lord Jesus, who was always looking for new adventures. But what will you do with all the fish we are going to catch? Store them up, eat them one day at a time, wait till there is a shortage, then put them on the market at top dollar and turn a big profit, many things. Peter smiled the smile of the fox Oh, said the Lord Jesus, 
who had that puzzled and pained look on his face that Peter had often observed, as if something that had never crossed his mind just made a forced entry. Peter wondered how someone as obviously intelligent as Jesus could be so slow in some matters. So the next morning at dawn, the Lord Jesus and St. Peter were down at the shore, readying their boat, and it was just as St. Peter had said. When the other fishermen saw St. Peter, they sidled over. Going out, Peter, they asked. Yes, answered Peter, not looking up from the nets. Mind if we follow along? Why not, shrugged Peter. And he looked at the Lord Jesus and said, See, St. Peter's boat led the way. The Lord Jesus was in the prow, hanging on tightly, for he was deeply afraid of the water. Now, St. Peter was a scientist of a fisherman. He tasted the water, scanned the sky, peered down into the lake, and gave the word in a whisper, over there. Why isn't anyone talking, asked the Lord Jesus. Shh, Peter shook his head. The boats formed a wide circle around the area that Peter had pointed out, let down the nets. Peter's voice crept over the surface of the water. Why don't they just toss them in, asked the Lord Jesus, who had hopes of learning about fishing. A second shh came from St. Peter. The fishermen let down their nets and began to pull them in, but something was wrong. The muscles of their arms did not tighten under the weight of fish. The nets rose quickly, the arms of the men slack. All they caught was water. The fishermen rowed their boats over to St. Peter. The greatest fisherman in all of Galilee, my grandmother's bald head. You brought us all the way out here for nothing. We have wasted the best hours of the day and have not one fish to show for it. Stick to preaching, Peter. And they rowed toward shore, shouting over their shoulders at Peter. The Lord Jesus said nothing. St. Peter checked the nets. He tasted the sea a second time. He scanned the sky a second time. He looked at the Lord Jesus a second time and said, over there. No sooner had he said over there than the Lord Jesus was at the oars rowing mightily. And all day long under the Syrian sun, the Lord Jesus and St. Peter rowed from place to place on the Sea of Galilee. And all day long under the Syrian sun, the Lord Jesus and St. Peter let down their nets. And all day long. Under the Syrian sun, the Lord Jesus and St. Peter hold in their nets. And all day long, under the Syrian sun, the Lord Jesus and St. Peter caught nothing. Evening fell. An exhausted St. Peter raised the sail to make for shore. The weary Lord Jesus held on tightly in the prow. It was then, as the boat glided toward shore, that all the fish in the Sea of Galilee came to the surface. They leapt on one side of the boat, and they leapt on the other side of the boat. They leapt behind the boat, and they leapt in front of the boat. They formed a cordon around the boat, escorting it toward shore in full fanfare. And then in a mass suicide of fish, they leapt into the boat. Laughing and landing in the laughing lap of the Lord Jesus, smacking the astonished St. Peter in the face. When the boat arrived at shore, it was brimming, creaking, sinking under the weight of fish. The other fishermen were waiting. They gathered around St. Peter and slapped him on the back. Peter, you scoundrel, you knew where the fish were all the time and never let on. They hit him on the shoulder. Peter, you rogue, you put us on. You surely are the greatest fisherman in all of Galilee. But Peter was uncharacteristically silent. He only said, give the fish to everyone. Tonight, no home in this village will go without food. 
After that, he said nothing. But later, Peter stared at the table and spoke in a chastened voice to Jesus. Go away from me. I am a sinful man. I wanted to use my skills to dominate others, to show them I was better than they were, to keep them in their place. I did not want the fish to feed hunger, but to lord it over you and the others, to make things better for me and worse for everyone else. You better go away from me. At that moment, Jesus loved Peter with the love that moves the sun and the stars, and he had no intention of going away. There was more fishing to be done. Well, we're finished for the day. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, I hope you'll come next week and or join us online when we're going to talk about living simply and seeking justice. Thanks for being here.